What's up, everyone? Welcome to Creator Support, the show where we answer your questions about the business of being a creator. Today on the show, we're talking about how to break into the top 1% of creators. We cover what we miss about the old YouTube. We go into how you split up revenue when there's multiple people working on a project. And we start with our experience at South by Southwest. All right, if you make it to the deep end, let us know. All right, back from Austin. Yeah, that was our third time at South by Southwest. Mm Mm-hmm. Austin's kind of becoming a creator hub. Like we spent time with Ryan Trahan there. The Night Media team is there, which is Jimmy's management company. Isaiah Photos there. Kind of felt like there's this this new like center for creativity there. There's a lot of momentum. And I don't know if it was you or me, but one of us said we should probably move there. That was you. What do you mean? Oh, was that me? (laughs) Uh, A lot of momentum. There's a lot of momentum there. Yeah. Uh, And it was a lovely time. It was our third time at South by Southwest. South by Southwest is this, you know, media, tech, music, you know, week in Austin. And we went and spoke with Harley Finkelstein, who's the president of Shopify. And that talk, if you want to listen to it, is actually out on YouTube. Put that in the description um, here. It's on Shopify's YouTube channel. But the one thing that I would say going last year and this year is very interesting. You brought this up when we were there. There was a tangible lack of crypto this year. Last year, South by Southwest, from media to tech to music was all about NFTs, digital collectibles, Mm -hmm. you know, token-gated communities. And this year, that was largely absent. Yeah, this year, the conversation was AI, artificial intelligence. And I think what's made me optimistic about the creator economy, or continually optimistic, is the fact that last year was crypto, this year was AI, but under it has been the creator economy. Like the conversations at South by Southwest have been, how can crypto and NFTs help creators? This year, it's how can AI help creators and companies? Mm -hmm. And it made me feel like the creator economy is not a bubble. It is sustaining and has been around for a while. And all of these new uh, things like crypto and AI are just kind of supplementary. So if they go away, creators will still be here. Yeah, and I think if you you take many steps back and think about like South by Southwest, the first time we went, you and I went, we actually made a video on our channel. We went to go watch documentaries to just get inspired. It was all about filmmaking. And, you know, every step of the way, it's all about how artists and creatives can, you know, monetize and and make a living and how they, you know, advance. And I think that the creator economy is just the, the, the step forward in that. Like how do artists and creatives make a living? And, you know, I think on AI and crypto, it's also like, how do these creators communicate this message to the rest of the world? Like every company that's engaging in that is looking at creators as the megaphone that can help mass adoption. Because if we start talking about all this stuff, then that is what encourages mass adoption, mm-hmm. right? Creators have millions of fans who then they can communicate new tech to, which is why every year it's out by Southwest, some new tech is like very exciting. The, the conference really became like big when Twitter was discovered there. Mm-hmm. Like that's when it kind of shifted and, and people got really into it. What was really great was the amount of people who came up to us afterwards. People actually snuck into the talk, which was, yeah. which was really fun to hear and be like. Didn't know that we yeah. have a sneak in audience, yeah. but that was pretty cool. But we hung out for about an hour after the talk uh, and answered questions from people. It was like. You live know, creator support. Real life creator support. So our first question on the show today is actually from someone after our talk who asked us live, we filmed it on this phone. Hey guys, I'm Tope Maude, I'm with The Hero. Okay. Uh, first question for creator support is, can you see any current or new or new creators breaking into that 1% that you mentioned? And the second question is, what determines the 1%? Subscribers, views, or money? So the context here is during our talk, we talked about you know how creators are building brands. So you know, Mr. Beast is building Feastables, I'm a Chamberlain with Chamberlain Coffee. But we also talked about how the addition of short form content is potentially broadening the gap between the top 1% of creators and the casual creator. There's more people now who can upload a short than you know ever. Like uploading a YouTube video used to have a really high barrier to entry. There are also more creators than ever who have a million people who follow them. Right, million subscribers. On yeah. TikTok or yeah. on Instagram or even on sure. YouTube. So the question is, is really interesting because we throw around that term a lot, the 1% of creators. And mm-hmm. I think- We're referring to Logan Paul, Emma Chamberlain, Mr. Beast, these household names. Yeah. But the question is asking, can anyone enter that 1%? Is it still accessible? Mm -hmm. And 
what does the 1% even mean? What are the characteristics? Because we throw it around, but I don't know if we've ever actually thought about this. So I, I have a very strong perspective on this. I think it's brand in the absence of uploading videos. Mm. So meaning like, does your brand exist when you don't upload? So if you are, you know, Emma Chamberlain, we talk about her all the time. Other people talk about her all the time. She doesn't upload that much, but her, her name exists. There's a brand there. I think it's, does your brand exist in popular culture? without uploading mm. because there are a lot of creators who don't need to upload to be relevant in a niche or in a community, sure. but they may not be what I consider the 1%. When I say 1%, I think about household names that have somewhat transcended. They are post-platform yeah. in a way, and they are a part of the mass media conversation. Like You can't go anywhere without seeing a clip or hearing about Logan Paul whether it's WWE or fighting yeah, sure. Floyd Mayweather, they talk about him on ESPN. I think that's like a step above like the post-platform people. Like I would consider someone like Ludwig to be in the top 1% of creators. And again, I think that there's, he uploads a lot, but I think there's a brand to Ludwig. Hmm. It's not just views, right? And I think a lot of young creators are pursuing viewership and how can I get my views up? But you have to also take a step back and be like, what does my brand stand for? Like, can people talk about me as a brand to other people without being like, he gets a lot of views? Is there another sentence there? Hmm. That's your step, step one to entering this world is like, you have to be able to build a brand. And if we think about this in the context of music or film or other, you know, artistic paths, what I would urge everyone to think about is like, why is a band still relevant if they don't put out an album? Why is an actor still relevant if he doesn't act in a movie for three years? Mm -hmm. You know, like Ryan Gosling is a great example. We bring him up a lot. He doesn't act in that many movies, but he's a massive brand. And I think that's the, that's the, the, the step of like, when I gauge success, it's brand. It's not views, yeah. it's not money. It's not subscribers. It's like, do you have brand leverage in the world? But I think some of that has to do with the fact that they have been in the market long enough to create a catalog of work that's still being consumed. Yeah. Even if Ryan Gosling isn't making a new movie or if Mr. Beast were to completely stop uploading, yeah, there's there enough. is so much work sure. available yeah. that is of a quality that people will continue to find it and watch it again and again. Agreed. So I think some of this, yeah. you know, is it possible to enter the 1%? Absolutely. Always is. Always it, has been. It just may also take time in market. Yeah. You know, it's not like, Alex Earl is potentially the TikTok creator of this year, yeah. of this moment, but it will take time and she will have to sustain over years mm -hmm. to get to that point where you can be in the 1%. Agreed. Yeah. I, yeah. I think like Alex Cooper from Call Her Daddy, like she transcended and moved into like brand. Yeah. Right. Like Alex Cooper and Call Her Daddy is a brand. Mm -hmm. So I think the the number one for me is just like, Focus on what your brand stands for beyond viewership. Now, Alex Rodriguez of Major League Baseball. Okay. Are we staying on the Alex? Sure. Are we? <laughs> no. Why not? I'll be honest. I didn't have anything there. I just thought, just how many it. more but, Alex but, names can we yeah, keep? Yeah, but A-Rod, like okay, he's a, a brand. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It actually does work. It works. <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Dino, short form content is his name on Twitter. Dino Favara. His name is Dino short form content. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. Like Dino, you're not going to get me in long form. Only 60 seconds of me at yeah. a time. First name Dino, last name short form content. Hey Colin and Samir, shout out to the original blue hat. I wanted to ask you guys, what is a season or a time period of YouTube that you miss? When you look back and you're like, man, I miss X. Like I miss prank videos. <laughs> uh, what's something you guys miss? and would bring back from old YouTube if you could. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. First of all, old publish at, it's awesome. Never going to make that again. Anyone who has it, rare. It's a rare thing to have. Someone posted on Twitter that they were on a Disneyland ride and it flew off and asked if we had more. We oh, do not. Man. No. Yes, we do. I'm pretty sure we have we don't. only one more. Yeah, it's behind you right now, actually. Exactly. But it's on the shelf. Not, it's, sort not, of, it's not available. available. It's not available. Yeah. We that's don't have any more. More yeah. of like, that's for the museum. Yeah. So just so you know, our drops are actually, you okay. know, like they're actually finite. Sorry to that person. I gave you false hope. Okay. So Dino, uh, I love this question. I think this goes in line with what we were just talking about, about the 1%. I think one of the reasons why it's so hard to break into the 1% is because there's so much content now. And you, When I get onto YouTube now, I'm like, everything feels 
like everything. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing feels unique to me. So to answer this question about the old YouTube, and I think a lot of people are starting to talk about this. I'm seeing a lot more thumbnails about this of like, I miss the old YouTube. The era that I missed the most was waking up every morning and watching a new Casey Neistat vlog. And the reason why I missed that era the most is because everything felt new to me. Like everything felt like I was discovering something new and, and creators were discovering a new way to make videos. Like Casey, when he mowed his lawn in Connecticut, I remember watching that video and I was like, how did this person make this interesting? What I miss about that era is that what he was doing and what people were doing during that time was unique to YouTube. I couldn't right. get that on Facebook. I couldn't get that on, on Instagram. Netflix, yeah. I couldn't get it on Netflix. I couldn't get it on TikTok because it didn't exist. Mm. I couldn't even get it anywhere else. So it felt so unique to the platform. Yeah. I would imagine it's maybe how streamers on Twitch feel right now or just streamers in general. Like what they're doing is so unique to their own platforms. Yeah, there was something so novel about it. Mm -hmm. Like you were just, it felt like we were discovering new land all together. You know, everything was like, whoa, that's crazy. You can do that on YouTube? Yeah. I guess so. And, you know, there was even comedians like, God, what was his name? Gus. Yeah. What was his last name? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't remember either. Uh, but he was uploading like one minute sketches on YouTube. And I remember when I saw that and I was like, that's new. That's interesting. I've mm -hmm. never seen someone do a minute, you know, sketches. I mean, honestly, with the first time I came across a David Dobrik vlog, I remember being hooked. I was like, whoa, I've never seen mm -hmm. something like this. You can cut out all the boring bits and just have this like intense highlight reel of funny moments. They were all formats reinvented. Yeah. With David Dobrik, right? It was, mm -hmm. oh, this is like Friends, but reinvented. But, but they were reinvented off of completely different, like, different styles. So David Dobrik was reinventing a television show, which was Friends. You know, Casey Neistat was, I don't know what he was reinventing, but he was reinventing, you know, just like the reality show or something. And now today, everything is a reinvention of something I've already seen mm -hmm. on YouTube. So it's like, oh, that's like Mr. Beast, but X. It's hard for me to even click on a thumbnail right now because I know what the video is going to be about. Mm -hmm. Or what it's going to be like. Or what it's going to be like. What it's going to feel like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I missed the time where you would click on a YouTube video and you had no idea what it would feel like. Mm -hmm. Like where there was, it wasn't so formulaic. I think we need to get back to, and this is not even YouTube, but the Vimeo staff pick era. Mm -hmm. There needs to be some version of the staff pick, something that is not algorithmically chosen necessarily, but is unique and interesting and worthy of being shown. Yeah. And is different. I mm -hmm. would love whatever that side of YouTube is. Yeah. Show me that. Something mm -hmm. that's never been done before, something that's unique, that maybe doesn't work with the current meta. Yeah. But is at least different. I think there's potentially right now going to be like a return to lo-fi quality because I think it's like, I mean, there's people, including us, who are struggling to put out content because the bar for themselves has gotten so high that, you know, one thing to bring him up again, Ludwig, what I love about Mogul Mail and what he's doing is he's like single takes. He's turning on a camera and talking. Yeah. And that to me feels very just like, back to the roots of what I thought YouTube was. Like I'm watching him and he's reinventing the monologue, the late night monologue. Yeah. Even MKBHD on his yeah, autofocus exactly. channel. Yeah, he's, he's just shooting straight out of a phone. Mm -hmm. And that's so special. That's like, you know, it's so reliant on the personality and the idea. Yeah. And I think coming back to, you know, someone's personality and how they can express it, just thinking back to Jenna Marbles, which I think was the first real viral YouTube video I ever saw, yeah. where she's filming straight out of her webcam and no cuts, just like being funny. Right now, I'm really, I'm not looking to be distracted. I've said that to you a few times. Yeah, I'm looking to learn. I'm looking to be inspired. Mm. And I don't need something that is worried that I'm going to click off at this point. I'm looking for something that's honest and new. And that's difficult to find. It's difficult. There's a Naval quote um, that that went on Twitter and, and I really liked it. It said, the problem is you're writing to be read. And I really enjoyed that because it makes me feel like a lot of YouTube videos today are, um, you know, including again, when we sit in an edit, we're editing to be watched. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, being in this business of being a creator, you have to be empathetic to the audience. But is there 
you know, wh- where are some of the videos that are just like, I'm creating this just to make it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that foundation. Yeah. Where I don't, I don't know what the potential outcome could be of it. I think we all know too well what the potential outcome of making a good yeah. YouTube video and is. And internally, now. that is something that we're facing. There's yeah, a video we're working sure. on right now where we just spent tons of time yeah. making it the shortest version that it could possibly exactly, be, yeah. a tight 10 minutes yeah. of just pure education. Yeah. And then we watched it and it felt forced. It, it didn't felt feel void of any any human <laughs> emotion. We cut out all humanity, including ourselves. It was like we were cutting for a robot. Yeah. You know, we're cutting for an algorithm. And so now we're looking at closer to a 30 minute version that mm-hmm. is at least a more realistic interpretation yeah. of the way the day happened. And I don't know if that's right for retention. I don't know if that's right for the algorithm, but I feel better about that version going out into the world and yeah. being around for the next five, 10, 15 years. Agreed. Yeah. I think that's, you know, cutting for the algorithm, which I think is getting misunderstood for cutting for the audience. You know, it's like, I do think that there's a world right now of fatigue on the current version of YouTube of like, I just want to see something that's real. I think that's why podcasts are getting so popular Mm -hmm. because it's like, this is a real conversation. This is a real moment. This is You're watching exactly how this moment is happening. I could say anything. I could do anything. Do something. I could quote Rick Rubin right now, Colin. Could you? I could. Yeah. But are you? I'm going to. Now? Just to close this part. Okay. He says, follow your own excitement, not the audience's. So I want to leave you with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next, next question. question. Um, this comes from our subreddit from Efficient Lab 5078. How should I split the percentage of revenue share on a channel I'm starting with my business partner? This is a question that I think we are uniquely um, capable of answering. Yeah. Yeah, good question for us. So he writes more. I'm about to start a channel focusing on a niche that my business partner is a professional in. While he will bring the personality, expertise, and content ideas I will bring the production, YouTube, and social media expertise. Without each other, we probably couldn't make a successful channel on our own. But together, I believe we have a great shot. So how should we split the revenue we make from our channel? I suggested 50-50, but my business partner believes the share should be split in his favor as he will bring the expertise and likely contribute a lot more to the channel than me. Does this sound fair? Or does this make sense to talk about percentage revenue share before we even make a single dollar? So when should we have that conversation? I just want to acknowledge that was some of my best reading on this show. Mm-hmm. I typically stumble. Congratulations. In, in long paragraphs, yeah. but I did not stumble. You're on today. I'm on, Colin. Must have been the cold plunge. Always a frightening moment in class when you're asked to read. Yeah. Yeah. Look All at right. you. Uh, how should I split the revenue share on a channel I'm starting? So uh, where do we begin? How this differs from you and I is that the one person, the, the person that he's partnering with is the expert, is there to bring the expertise, is the authentic member of the, mm-hmm. of the group here when it comes to the content that's coming out. Whereas with you and I, it's a shared passion for the creator space, mm-hmm. for creativity in general, and for making things. Yeah, uh, And we also share some of the production abilities. Mm-hmm. It's not as black and white. I, I think from a business perspective, it is reasonably black and white with us though. Like, yeah. you know, like the only reason this works in the way it works is not because like in this context, like I'm on camera and you're, you know, doing post-production, like the, the creative stuff is reasonably shared, but largely lays on your shoulders Mm -hmm. and the business stuff, meaning how do we make money from this lies on my shoulders. And that to me in a creative business, there's creative and business. And those feel like 50% Mm -hmm. of each which is, I think, where why we landed on 50-50 and probably because there was no other conversation that we had mm-hmm. when it came to percentage split down, right? Yeah. Like, it wasn't like, let's sit down and let's map out what each of us is going to do. We had been working together long enough that it was like, let's just, let's just make this and see what happens. We'll split everything 50-50. Yeah, but in this instance, business is actually not even kind of part of the equation. Yeah, true. It, it's more so about the shared, the, the expertise. Yeah. Who is the actual creator versus who is mm. in production? You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Because so, yeah, the one partner point. is not actually a creator as well. Yeah. I think- um, In terms of being on camera. Yeah. I think, yeah, because what we're talking about is like splitting a business, like starting an LLC and being like, we are both equal owners of this business. The YouTube channel is part of that business. Yes. There are other parts of this business too. Um, so I think specifically on a YouTube channel, like number one, you absolutely should have this conversation now. 
Without question, just to answer that, you mm-hmm. should have the qu- this conversation now before you start creating. And you should go into it both being happy with the outcome. Yes, Because yes. if there's any bit of, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is not mm-hmm. fair, yeah. Yeah. that will only increase in intensity over time. So if you're truly like the, you know, YouTube channel manager type person, right? You're like you're, you're, you're editing the videos, you're shooting the videos, you're titling them, thumbnailing them. Like I agree that the whole channel doesn't exist without you. Now, on the other side, if you're the expert, you're the person on camera, the whole channel doesn't exist without you. So uh, a lot of times how this works is like the creator brings on, you know, an editor or a, you know, production person. And there are creators who split revenue with that person. Now, what you could do is develop a, you know, floor where it's like, here's how much you'll make no matter what. uh, And the creator is actually paying you. And then they say, you know, plus X percentage of the channel, let's say 10 to 20% of the channel. So you have a guaranteed amount of uh, compensation, plus you have 10 to 20% upside in how the channel progresses. Because mm-hmm. the channel's not going to make any money at first. So like to, to do a pure play revenue share, if you guys actually want to go in together, just revenue of the channel, if it's a new channel, you're not going to make any money for the first year, maybe two years, maybe three years. First question, are you comfortable with that? Because you are not gonna, you, you might not make any money. Mm-hmm. The ways you will make money are AdSense brand deals. And then potentially this person, this expert's brand might grow to a point where they can do speaking engagements. They can do, you know, ambassadorship, sponsorship. So do you want to participate in the whole business of this person becoming a personality or just the YouTube channel? And if it's just the YouTube channel and it's just on revenue share, you are taking equal risk or you know, a large, a good amount of the risk. But if you're not the expert or the creator, then it might be less than 50%, right? The 60, person, 40, 70, 30, something mm-hmm. like that. And I think some of that is because the person who is on camera, the creator, takes on more risk. Mm-hmm. The person who's behind the scenes can sort of act without everything they're doing being known by the public. Yes. So True. if something happens to the brand, it's the creator's face who is the one who's taking the brunt of that. Sure. Who, and who potentially has the most to lose and couldn't go to another organization. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. They also have a lot of upside, like you said. There's the opportunity to do speaking, potentially. Sure. There are so many outlets for revenue. But I do think that person takes on more risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe you say it's 70-30 in the creator's favor or in the in the on-camera personality's favor, but you also are connected to brand deals and you know consulting and whatever comes from the YouTube channel. And maybe there's comfort level in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're taking a a less percentage, but of more opportunities. Now to do this, you have to be very confident, you know, that this is how you want to spend your time. And this is a risk you're willing to take because starting something from new is a risk and going in on a percentage, you are taking a risk. It might, that percentage, whether it's 50% or 30% could be $0. 100%. All right. We have a video question here. Hey boys, so I've got a question in regards to production schedules and building out the systems around that. A little birdie did tell me that you guys manage your production schedule in Notion. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but I would personally, now that it's a video podcast, watch the shit out of that episode if you could just show us the back end of Notion. All jokes aside, I'm currently in the process of launching a show on YouTube and I'm currently building out the systems and processes to manage the production schedule. Now, you guys have been at this a really, really long time. You've built a team around it and you've got a really strenuous upload schedule across long form, short form across all social platforms, uh, audio, newsletter. It's, It's a lot besides maybe the main channel this year, but We'll get to that later. All jokes aside, I'd love to know how you guys manage the production schedule and if you have any practical advice for myself and your audience. Love your work, guys. We'll talk soon. What a just sharp looking video. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Just what a great video. I love the jump cuts too for efficiency. That's very nice. So process, notion. We have tried that a few times. Mm-hmm. I would say, just so everyone knows here, Colin is pretty adver- is pretty against like, productivity software. I'm not against it at this point. I just don't even see it. It's right. not even it's in not my even world. in your universe. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, you may yeah. have shown it to me a million times. Yeah. I may have even been active in it. Right. But it's not in my head. It's, it's gone. gone in your head. It's it's gone. Gone. It just comes yeah. in and it goes out. Right. I can't do it. Your brain is built on productivity software. Yeah, I like it. I think it's great. It's, it's nice to dive into those. Yeah. But we do have a lot built on Notion. I would not say that we have much of our YouTube content built on Notion. Our newsletter, mm-hmm. uh, heavily built into a Notion, you know, 
template when it comes to, you know, the newsletter comes out three times a week and there's three stories in each. Like that is, a, yeah. it's a lot of content that we're pumping out and we need to organize that, organize thoughts. Um, a lot of where our brainstorming happens or just cross content communication happens on Slack. So a lot of the process happens on Slack. We're talking to different team members. We mm -hmm. were, you know, organized by different channels. Um, and then it goes into Notion for the newsletter and then those get built out. There's partner templates, you know, okay, here's, here's the sponsor this week. Here's their talking points. We we'll write the ad. Like there's a lot that happens in there. Um, our when course it, development is yeah. being done on Notion. Yeah, right that's now. right. So our upcoming our course, course mm -hmm. all the different modules, what yes. we want to say in each of them, what some of the graphics look like, yes. timelines, that's all in Notion. Yeah. Everything else is kind of done in Google Docs and Google Slides. Like this right now, what, what we're doing right now with creator support, what happens is every week we are pulling questions and our producer, Marilyn, pulls questions in. You know, those get put into a Google Doc. Colin and I review them. We edit the questions that we like and, you know, the ideas that we can do for the episode. And then those go to Jesse, who's then pulling the questions into a template for the episode. And then we shoot the episode and there's, there's a process to creator support. And what I want to talk about here is the concept of process and creativity. I think process works really well in certain forms of creativity, forms of creativity that, you know, follow a schedule, forms of creativity that are like, here's a canvas and we're going to paint it no matter what every week. So mm -hmm. this show is a great example of that no matter what, this comes out on Thursdays, the canvas is here. We sit down in the chairs and we're going to, we're going to make the show. Yeah. What, where process doesn't work well for me is in just like inspiration based creativity because it's very hard to build a process around what you're excited about. Mm -hmm. You can't really build a process and be like, let me hop into Notion and find inspiration. That's really hard. Yeah. So we have actually, last year, I think with all the growth that we experienced, what I realized is that what we need to do is as Colin and Smear and the Colin and Smear main channel needs to be a place where you and I are excited. Mm -hmm. That is very hard to build process around because we just need to be excited. Yeah. Your energy for ideas are the engine of a creative company. Yes. Like, I don't care what type of creator you are. For sure. For the most part, you have to be energized around an idea and have a process that allows you to remain energized mm -hmm. until you press publish. Yeah, and that might mean no process. That might mean you're just like, I got excited, so I made this video, and now I'm not excited for a couple months, so I don't make any videos. Mm -hmm. But- as I realized last year, as we were growing the company and we were hiring employees and, and building out the studio space was that we needed some content avenues that had a process, a predictable process that you could hire employees for that could get better and better every week. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the newsletter for us is absolutely a process, right? Three times a week, no matter what. Mm -hmm. This show, once a week, no matter what. Even interviews for the main channel, there's more of a process mm -hmm. there that we yeah. can commit to. And our shift to podcasts in general right. was about de developing, a process. developing a process. What yeah. I do think is important is that as a creator, you have a litmus test for, do you like this idea? How energized are you? Yeah. Mark Robert told us when we were with him that the majority of his best ideas come from moments where he is telling people in real life conversations. Mm -hmm. If he's explaining to someone something that he's excited about, that he keeps telling person after person after person, right. that's probably an idea that he could turn into a YouTube video. Yeah, totally. I think um, we were talking to Austin Kleon, which was an amazing conversation. He wrote Steal Like an Artist. We've talked about that book before. And like to get to talk to the author was amazing. Uh, but we were talking about the concept of, you know, writing in a notebook, you know, and like the old school way of thinking, <laughs> which sounds funny to say, but like pen and pad. And he was talking about, that sometimes you need to add that tangibility to an idea. Like you are actually doing something. You are putting your hand on a pen and putting that on paper and writing the idea out and drawing. And there is friction to that. It's not easy. It's not smooth, like typing mm -hmm. something. It's like, it, it's connecting your body and your mind to the idea. And I would say that a lot of, when I feel creative inspiration, that's, that's when I, I, I try and turn to like an analog very inefficient process, but that's what creative work is. It's inefficient. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I'm excited, so I'm going to try this thing. Um, but, you know, I think, again, to, to close the loop, it's like, pair that concept of leaving space and time for you to just be like, coming up with ideas, getting excited, with the more media component of like, I create a schedule, 
And I have a team around me that helps build a process mm -hmm. where Google Docs, Google Slides is, is how we build a lot of our shows. Um, you know, Notion is how we build a lot of our news, newsletters. And maybe one day we'll open that up and show everyone what it looks like. Yeah. And the one thing I'll add is that doing this mm -hmm. has opened up avenues for main channel videos. Yeah, right. Which is really interesting. Which is really cool. Because we have a process here that we're sticking to where mm. we have to get in these seats, we have to paint this canvas, as yes. you say. Things are coming up that we didn't know were going to come up that are leading yeah, to yeah, conversations. Yeah. People are commenting and we're getting on remote interviews with those people. Totally. There are things that are happening here yeah. because we have constraints that are turning into ideas we're really excited about. Excited yeah, about, yeah, about, yeah, yeah. yeah that don't have as much yeah. of a process. Mm -hmm. We're experimenting with those processes. It's processes? An, processes. Pr process eyes. Process. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> it is an uncomfortable experience to be three months, you know, as of today, the day that this video comes out, three months with no long form uploads on the main channel. It's a very uncomfortable experience. But I would say that what feels really good is when we were in Austin, like, you know, creativity struck us like at one in the morning before we went to bed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in, in our apartment in Austin. And we sat in the living room and we were like, oh man, that's such a good idea. And we're just writing and coming up with things. And like, it's, you just never know when it's gonna hit. And I think now as I look to the next four or five, six videos that are coming on the main channel, and as we do start uploading there, I feel better about them than if we rushed it. Yeah. You know, if we if we tried to rush it. And it's, it's weird, it's uncomfortable. We're probably gonna talk a lot about what is this, how did this break impact our channel? How does it impact you know, what we're doing here, but I feel really good to be excited about the videos that are coming out. And that's something that I have to, I have to have for this career to be sustainable. Like I have to have that, that excitement. I have a theory about my own creativity. Okay. I think I've been less creative lately because I'm going to bed too early. Yeah. I always used to come up with my best ideas Late at one night. in the morning. Yeah. And then I was really sleepy and I couldn't get up early. Sure. I was, I never used to be a morning person. This year, I've been getting up around 6, 30, 7 a.m. and going to bed really early. Yeah. I think that's a problem. Yeah. I, I think I need less sleep. I agree sleep. with that. I, I, I agree with what you're talking about, which is like, there's a radical nature to being a creative. And once you start playing into the more I'm normal so version of radical life, yeah. right now. Yeah. When you, when you plug into the, like Jesse Sebastiani from, he was part of Nelk and we interviewed him and that's coming on, on the main channel soon. But he was talking about when, when he left Nelk in full send, he you know, converted the warehouse into a new creative agency for himself called Sunday. And he didn't have a place to live, so he just slept in his warehouse. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a guy who received millions of dollars after a, you know, selling his shares in Nelk, who could absolutely afford something, you know, like a place to live or a hotel. Get a hotel if he wants for two, two months even. But he slept in the warehouse. And, you know, he felt like very a part of that idea mm -hmm. and embedded with it. And I think that there is like a bit of a, you know, radical nature to being creative and a creative person that you have to embody when you get excited about an idea, you have to find a, a place to, you know, foster that and be, and live inside of the idea. Sometimes you send me a text at 10.02 and I don't see it till the next morning. Yeah, that's crazy. Because that's, that's crazy yeah. how not radical I am yeah. and how much I'm prioritizing sleep. Mm. It's a problem. I mm. need to get rid of that. Get rid of sleep. And yeah. show up tired. You take anything from this episode, it's it, sleep, stay up all night. Sleep yeah. less. <laughs> yeah. So one more thing I want to say about YouTube and putting out regular content and, and having this like schedule and process where you have guaranteed stuff that's going to come out is it's something that Ali Abdal talked about, which is like an opportunity surface. So every video that goes out creates an opportunity for us. It might be an opportunity for someone to connect, someone to learn something, um, but also an opportunity that comes back to us, right? Someone who wants to be on the show. Like when we were putting out regular interviews last year on the main channel, that's when we got amazing, interesting inbound from people we couldn't believe were reaching out to be on the show, right? And so like having that, although sometimes can be exhausting, it does create this surface of opportunity for you. Um, and I think that's a really special thing about building process and being able to get out stuff on a regular basis. Agreed. All right, this question came straight into our Instagram DMs from Permanent Glue. I'm a freelance graphic designer and a creator who posts videos about the same niche, graphic design. I feel like I always need to work as a graphic designer even if my content is making me a living because the identity of being a designer is what informs and betters my content. Any advice to creators who kind of still need to participate in their career alongside with making content about it? 
It's such an interesting question. I actually put you and I in a similar situation. Yeah. I feel like we have to experiment on the main channel mm -hmm. and we have to be in edits, yeah. trying new things, dealing with thumbnails, yeah, yeah. YouTube studio. We have to do that. We can't only talk about when we, I mean, granted, we've never stopped, but I would never want us in a situation where it's like, oh yeah, two years ago yeah. or a year ago, we used to do that type of thing. Yeah, but what's funny is inherently, if we are talking about it, we are doing it. Like the, of course. Th this moment, our niche is so specific that it's like, but I guess it's the same as graphic design. Like if you are making videos about graphic design and you are graphic designing in those videos, you you are doing the work, but I understand the question of like, he's not going and getting clients and, and going through that yeah. experience. Yeah, it's a different type yeah. of graphic design. Totally, yeah, that's, it's incredibly important, I think, if you're you know a craftsman uh, to do the craft. But I understand that m your videos might actually be making you more money than doing the craft. It's like Ali Abdal, you brought this up yesterday. Like Ali Abdal was, you know, in medical school and then became a doctor. And while he was a doctor, was making content about being a doctor, but making content about being a doctor was making him more money than being a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a confusing, like, what do you do there? It's, yeah. it's probably similar to real estate agents, you know, mm -hmm. real estate agents who come on YouTube, who talk about being a real estate agent, make more money talking about being a real estate agent than being the real estate agent. Yeah. But authenticity matters. Everyone can see through it and everyone wants to relate to, to someone. Like when I watch someone, you know, talk about cooking, it would be very uninteresting if they didn't have the experience of actually trying recipes and cooking and messing up. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I want you to actually go do that and be that person. Yeah, you need to live an interesting life to mm. then have stories to tell. There it is. That's what yeah. we're getting to. That's what we're getting to. Yeah. Okay, we are uh, currently in the deep end, Colin. Yeah, I know. My, my snorkel's deep. already in. It's already in. Okay, yeah. we are deep in the deep end um, and we want to address something straight from the subreddit. This subreddit is quickly becoming r slash new tubers, and I don't really like that. A lot of recent posts in here about talking about people's personal channels, asking for advice and what they can do better. I don't mind it conceptually, but I feel like it doesn't belong on this subreddit. This is for CNS's content and maybe stuff about the creator economy at large. Some randos channel with 15 subs that isn't getting views, isn't relevant to any of that. Wow, harsh. Um, it's also the most upvoted. Most upvoted, post. yeah. I think, um, you know, the subreddit developed out of you know, our, our episode we did about KSI subreddit and exploring this concept of these, you know, content ecosystems and, and, and feedback loops, mm -hmm. um, and us wanting to talk more directly to all of you and, and have a more close relationship with all of you. I think, uh, all of everything that's happening in the subreddit deserves a space, like whether it's sharing your ideas with someone for feedback, um, but I think one of the challenges is that Reddit is a forum, so it's all happening in one place. What probably makes sense for us, and I'm saying this because it's definitely happening, <laughs> okay. is, is that we are going to launch a Discord. Yeah. Because Discord will offer us the opportunity to create multiple channels and spaces for you. If you want to talk about thumbnails, you can do that over there. If you want to get feedback on your last edit, and there's people who want to do that there, they can join that channel. If you want to see behind the scenes from what we're doing here, you if you can just want to talk about what happens in the deep end, sure, there could be a channel for that. Oh, that's a good idea. But it doesn't cloud, yeah, you know, the overall conversation. Well, why don't we ask? Okay, so we are developing this idea, this Discord uh, concept, and trying to figure out what channels would be really cool in there. Would love to crowdsource some ideas. Put them in the comments. Uh, you can tweet them at us if you're listening. But let us know what you think would be cool as a channel. Like, what would you what would you want to talk about? Um, we're brainstorming that currently in the moment. So we are listening to all of you on the subreddit and working to solve this problem of, you know, one big forum and, and understanding how we can curate this to give everyone a better and more value forward experience. What do we call the discord? Colin and Samir's discord. Uh, wow. Real creator support, real original. Colin. Well, you know, we could use some help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be good. If you guys have ideas, I, I, I think probably it's like broadly Colin and Samir, and then there's different spaces for creator support. There's different spaces for news and the published press. Uh, I think it's like a, a place for creators to to hang out and, um, you know, but I will say that everything we're doing here is, is largely to make sure that all of you get value from it. Um, there's stuff that we really want to do in there, but I like the discord is going to be a space for the community. So would love to source ideas for that. Uh, put them anywhere. You know, comments, Reddit, tweets. Okay, speaking of 
the subreddit. The second most upvoted post beyond that was this awesome post from an Italian creator that as many others have already said, it's time for the show to broaden its pool of creators being interviewed and analyzed. So let's watch this video real quick because this was very fun. Samir, Colin, this is for you. You need to interview this guy. He broke every sensible rule on how to grow a fan base. Yet, he has been able to become one of the top content creators in Italy in record time. I watched all your vids since your Jackcoin collab. I'm aware of all best YouTuber storytelling techniques and I'm telling you, he's on another level. He recorded himself as a kid with the foresight that he might use the clips in future videos. And now he's dropping them randomly with his adult self talking to the past self. He managed to troll several Italian newspapers into believing his real name was Sergio Lerme, only to launch years later a perfume with the same name. Speaking of which, he's cutting edge even in the business side. He shoots and sells a yearly calendar of his mom's dog. And by the way, through all these years, he managed to make his mother a main character of his vids, yet kept her identity and privacy cleverly concealed in this funny manner. He co-hosts one of the biggest podcasts in Italy. He even managed to interview Katie before you guys. Is there surfing in Italy? Uh, we don't have the ocean, but we can surf here. A little way. Okay, well, when you come to California next, I'll take you surfing. So go ahead, make this happen. I can't wait to see your talent for dissecting creators' secret sauce applied to Luis Sal. Okay, that is probably one of the most creative creators I've seen in a while. Like that, some yeah. of that stuff is really cool. I mean, to film yourself as a child, yeah, knowing that you will then create videos as an adult with that footage, super cool, is very advanced, pretty profound. Yeah, <laughs> that is really interesting. I've never heard of anything yeah. like like that. Speaking of looking for unique mm -hmm. creative on YouTube, yeah, that's clearly it. That's unique. Um, I love creative that just doesn't follow rules. That it's just like, what is he? He's making a calendar with his mom and her dog. <laughs> like what? And he convinced newspapers that his name was something and then launched a perfume with that. Like that is so interesting. And I think um, something that that is important is to recognize that like what makes people talk, what makes a headline is something that's unexpected like string words together that are unexpected. And when someone can talk about you like that in ways that makes you go, whoa, that was unexpected. That's when you're like doing something very unique. Mm -hmm. Now, what he asked at the end was like, I'd love for you to broaden, you know, your your scope of what's happening in creators around the world and like dissect this creator. I think you just did that, which is really cool. And maybe we should do a call out for other international creators, but like do a spotlight on an international creator and we'll put it in the show. That was super cool. Yeah, I like, think- I just learned about a new creator. There's only yeah. so much that- We can watch. That you and I can watch and that we can retain. Yeah. And I would love if other people did that. If they did the job of profiling creators that they think are unique and mm -hmm. they think are interesting and send it to us on Twitter, put it in the subreddit. Eventually, I'm sure super we'll have a Discord cool. channel for that. But yeah, I think creator discovery is such a- um, valuable thing because mm -hmm. of how many creators there are that it's something we try and do in the newsletter yeah. and try and do here, but I would love if people helped us out. Yeah. Broaden our view of the creator economy. Tell us about international creators. Anyone who's doing something interesting that we haven't talked about, let us know. All right. Let me end with a gripe. Okay. I've probably shared this before, but it's bothering me a lot right now mm. when I go to a coffee shop and I'm going to sit there, but they serve me coffee in a to-go cup. And you explain explicitly asked for. Yes. Well, they're like, oh, we don't do that. We don't do, we don't, oh. we don't do mugs here. Okay. I think if, if, if you're a coffee shop and you're, you have seats, you should have mugs. Have you tried bringing your own mug? That's a good idea. I was at a coffee shop last week and this guy brought his own mug. That mm -hmm. was a very unique mug. It was yeah. polka dotted and, and really intricate and huge. Mm, big mug. And he's sitting there next to me waiting for his coffee and then looks over at the other side of the bar and there's a guy- With the same mug? No, drinking his coffee out of his mug. They gave his oh, mug- To another guy? To a stranger. That's funny. It was funny. It was, was a good moment. Yeah. yeah, he didn't take it well. All right, well, thanks for listening to this episode of Creator Sport. If you guys have more questions, you can put them in the comments here on YouTube. You can also tweet them at us or put them in the subreddit. Thanks for listening. See you next week.